Hello everyone. A little while ago, we covered the story of Skolomance and the Western Plaguelands, which of course had a lot of people wanting to see the follow-up. See the story of the Eastern Plaguelands, like its Western counterparts. The Eastern Plaguelands, it was once a beautiful land and parts of the Kingdom of Lordaeron. Strathholm was the largest city of the kingdom, with its regional government centered around this city but it too felt the effects of the plague. The grain that was meant to feed their people and sustain life, it been infected. Now it would cause them to die. Even worse, come back as mindless undeads in servitude of the Lich King. Their Prince Arthas did everything he could to stop it. But ultimately, he too fell to the schemes of the Lich King. After following Malganus and traveling to Northrend, he decided to pick up the Curseblade Frostmourne to claim his revenge. He now serves the very thing that he tried to fight against. Death washed over the lands of Lordaeron and it made its way to the high home of the High Elves as they had need of their magical well of power. They needed the Sun Well. I dearly hope that there's a special place in Hell waiting for you, Arthas. We may never know, Uther. I intend to live forever. If we follow the path that they took, the first location that pops up, that is the Maristad. Maybe not a name that immediately rings a bell, as he now goes by the name of Lightcaller. But in life, Nefanos used Maris, the name of his family. The first and only human ranger, trained by the High Elves themselves. This land was tended to by his grandfather, his father, and perhaps, if things would have worked out differently, by Nefanos himself. We can only wonder how many moments Sylvanas and Nefanos were able to steal away here, before the darkness of the world took away their chances and their time. First, there was the Horde invasion to deal with, and then the Undead Scourge. Both of them would fall to the might of Arthas. Sylvanas fell to Frostmourne itself, whereas Nefanos, he was slain by Ramstein the Gorger, and both of them would regain control. Sylvanas was first, and one of the first things she set out to do was to bring back her champion. Her Banshee's voice, as well as just her presence, the memories of their lives together, it was able to set Nefanos free of the haze clouding his mind. I am yours, Dark Lady, he told Sylvanas, for all my days. During Classic, we would see him hang out at the lands of his family. And of course the Alliance, they had no idea of the true fate of Nefanos Maris. In their eyes, he was still a hero of the war. A tactical genius responsible for Alliance victory spanning a decade of conflict. They had no idea where his loyalties truly were. So heroes, they formed raids, they gathered their might and released Nefanos from his tormented undead life. Or at least that's what they thought. Feign death is a powerful ability and Nefanos was able to fool them in thinking that he was dead. The war chief's will be done. The Horde, they had him as their quest giver, handing out several quests. One of them would send him over to the Qualifian Lodge, where exiled High Elves were living out their days. When Arthas used the Sunwell, the found of power, it became corrupted. So much so that the High Elves, they were forced to destroy it. Millennia of feeding on these magics though, it had made them incredibly addicted. For the survival of their people, they were forced to drain magic, even from living things, which some amongst their race, they simply refused. They did not want to become some kind of vampire feeding on others. And so Lorfmar had told them to go. We come in the name of the champion of the Banshee Queen, the Horde said when they arrived. You have something that belongs to him. The copy of the registry detailing the Vanus acceptance into the Farsiders. That's the thing he was after. And he made sure to have his forces leave as much strife and grief as possible within their wake. To leave these high elves suffering. And suffer they did. In time, we would see the Sunwell reignited, birthing a brand new future for the now called Blood Elves. They were in a much stronger position now, one that had Lorfmar offer these exiles aid from Silvermoon. But they refused. They wanted nothing to do with Lorfmar and the allies that he keeps. Deal with the devil as you please. I can only hope that you get what you deserve. Lorfmar did not blame them for their reaction. He only felt sorrow for the way that things turned out. The elves at Qualifian Lodge, they'd seen hell over the years, living in the Plaguelands, and their fate would only be to fall to the very thing that they were exiled for. Their commander stumbled upon an item of magical energy, one that they simply couldn't resist. Its seductive power, it corrupted them, turned them into the wretched, fit only to be put out of their misery. We have made many sacrifices. Now another quest that was handed by Nefanos, that is to go out and collect relics from the Battle of Darrowshire. This is a town nearby, a battle worthy of song. 
Derosire. This battle of Derosire took place when the Scourge forces rampaged across Lord Ron. It was cut off from the bulk of Alliance forces, but the town was bolstered by a company of troops, a contingent of paladins of the Silver Hand, and a staunch group of local militia led by Captain Joseph Redpaw. The Scourge first assaults on Derosire. They were sparrows, small groups of marauding skeletons and corpses. They wandered the outskirts of the village, and they were repelled. But the Scourge were not bogged by the defenders' tenacity and responded in kind. Soon after the first wave of attacks, a second wave emerged. Champion Ghouls, servant of the ghoul Lord Horgus, screamed down from the hills and clashed with the beleaguered Derroshire defenders. The defenders weakened, but were relieved by paladins, disciples of the Silver Hands. Their leader, Davil Crockford, he was a native of Derroshire. He brought his followers to the village when he heard of the impending attack. And together with the defenders, they held back the servants of Horgus. When Horgus himself entered the battle, he met with Davil. For many minutes they fought, and Davil eventually prevailed, but he suffered a mortal wound and died soon after defeating the Ghoul Lords. The battle continued, and Captain Repov led his militia bravely. It might have been won had the captain not been corrupted by the death knight Marduk the Black. In the middle of the fray, Marduk rode up the Repov, and with black magic he tore loose Repov's spirit, twisting it into an evil shadow of the brave captain. The corrupted Captain Repov then spread his evil taint amongst the defenders of Derroshire, who betrayed their allies and slaughtered them. They then turned on the town of Derroshire and killed all who hid in their homes. The remaining Scourge army, along with the corrupted spirit of Captain Repov, then left the ravaged village of Derroshire and tore into Lordaeron, adding to the pain and death of the war. Can you help me find my dolly? We learn of this history through a very tragic questline with the spirits of little Pamela. Her aunt hid her away during the battle, but she doesn't know what happened to her and she wants us to check it out. Like her auntie. Pamela has a spirit now. She did not survive the horrors that fell upon Derroshire. She's missing her family greatly, not to mention her dolly. It's easier for us to bring her back her doll, so that's the first thing that we do. And then it's time to mess around with time itself and recruit the aid of the bronze dragon Chromie. Now we can't exactly go around and change history entirely. Joseph Repov, he still needs to die and become corrupted. But at least we could immediately end the suffering by defeating his corrupted form. That way, his spirit can reunite with Pamela, return home from the war, meaning that we've got a job to do. We find the annals of Derroshire detailing the events of what happened here. Chromie then uses their magic, adding pages that describes the eventual fates of those that took place in the battle. We need that knowledge, as we need these relics of the past for the time magic to work. Horgus the Ravager fell at the Battle of Derroshire, but the evil within him was not fully spent. The victorious Scourge forces removed his skull from the battlefield, carrying it with them to so dread amongst the living that they faced. Days later, the company of Scourge who possessed the head were defeated by Silverhand Paladins. Horgus' head was then cast into the Blackwood Lake. Marduk the Black still lives, yet his sword was lost in a battle near Corin's Crossing. A dwarf captain shattered the sword on his enchanted shield, forcing Marduk to flee the field and win it a day for the alliance. Marduk's sword sank into the earth and corrupted it, eating a gorge into the land, now known as the Infected Scar. Devil Lightfire died at the battle, but his bravery inspired the alliance throughout the war. His book, His Paladin's Librum, was recovered by Scarlet Crusade troops. It now resides in the town hall of Harkland often read by crusaders eager to draw from Davil's strength. And then Joseph Repov. He was killed during the Battle of Derroshire. His spirit was corrupted and took a new shape, and this creature spread great evil in Lord Oran. At Garen's withering, east of Anderhal, the corrupted Repov was finally defeated by Alliance forces. His shield still rests near the barn of the plague's farmstead, and skirt minions are still drawn to the memory of his evil. The bundle of relics, as well as skulls of the Scourge who participated in his battle, their place within town, allowing us to relive the battle as it played out. Only this time, the corrupted Joseph is not allowed to leave the Arrowshire. We end him here and now, forgiving him for what has happened and reuniting Pamela with her daddy. Now, not all of the Red Paths have been wiped out, though. Her older sister left Lordaeron during the first Horde invasion, whereas her uncle, Carlin Red Path, he survived the Battle of Derroshire and then joined the Argent Dawn. 
We actually found him at Light's Hope Chapel, which has been pretty much the remaining bastion of light in this area against these invading undead forces. When Arthas decided to purge Treffel, and Ufer refused to follow that order, he told him and his fellow paladins of the Silver Hands that their organization was suspended from service. Have you lost your mind, Arthas? These paladins, they flow out of an organization called the Church of the Holy Light, which goes way back in time, more than 2000 years ago. We're talking about a time period in which the early humans, they teamed up with the High Elves to take on the trolls. Trolls that weren't too happy with these new settlers in their lands. Even to this day, we can still find remnants of the trolls in the Plague Lands, like at the area called Zul Mashar. Sadly though, like so much in this land, they've fallen to undeath. So back in the day, visions from strange forms, thrumming with holy power, they sparked the human's faith in the holy light and became the predominant human religion. Centuries later, Lordaeron's leaders codified the different light-based traditions and belief systems. From these efforts, the Church of the Holy Light came to be. Lordaeron served as the home of this church, with the most important place of worship located in the Verdant Eastwald, the original name of the Plague Lands. Amongst the oldest and most revered of these holy sites, that was Anderhall, Light's Hope Chapel, Strathholm and Tears Hand. Then the Horde came to Azeroth, and Alonso's fall, he came up with the idea of combining the teachings of the church with the skills of a warrior. Just like that, the first paladins of the Silver Hand came to be. A great asset in the war against the Horde, and now Arthas, he wants to put them out of service. The boy was not a king yet though, nor did the paladins simply stop being paladins because their prince told them to do so. These members of the Silver Hands, they would continue on the battle, continue to defend their lands against the darkness. Many of them were slain when Arthas returned as a Death Knight, yet the light is not easily vanquished. Some of these defenders would then go on to form an organization known as the Argent Dawn, whereas the most zealous ones amongst them, they would form the Scarlet Crusade. The Scarlets were infiltrated by a dreadlord, manipulated from within, pushing them ever further and further to the point where they could no longer see the difference between the living or the undead. All of them, that did not stand with them, they had to be purged within the light. So yeah, not the best organization to find yourself in. Now the whole necromancy thing, raising the fallen into undeath, it did not just count for those recently slain. Heroes of the past, warriors, priests, paladins, champions of battles long gone, they were buried in cemeteries and catacombs. They quickly figured out that they couldn't let the Scourge get their hands on them. So after Arthas had killed his father and the Scourge rampaged through their lands, a secret mission began. It was decided that their honored debt would be transported to the Light's Hope Chapel. This small, out-of-the-way location, it was perfect to rebury them within the sacred crowns. A thousand of the bravest souls to walk the earth, together here, combined, they can defend these sacred crowns. We've seen this take place. We've seen the heavens open up here as Darian Mograine sacrificed himself, which decimated the forces Kalfuzad had sent out to try and claim the chapel. That day was saved, yet dying while fighting the scourge. It often means that you wake up fighting on the other side. In this case, Darian returned as a death knight, leading the forces of the Ebonholds, pushing the Scarlets out of the enclave and then onto the assault. Now he was attacking the chapel that he had given his life for to defend. Arthas the Lich King, he knew full well that his death knights, they were sent to their doom. But in his eyes, it was well worth the sacrifice if a man drawing out High Lord Tyrion Fordring. Tyrion was a member of the Order of the Silver Hand, but was kicked out when he helped out the Orc Etric. This forced him to leave his family behind, living his life in exile for quite some time. We could even find him during Classic, help him try to save his son. Salem Fordring, he had renounced the Order of the Silver Hand. With so many of the members that his father in exile, he decided to join the Scarlet Crusade. In Northdale, he dropped the symbol of lost honor, a symbol of the Silver Hand that we recovered. Again, not an organization that Tyrion wanted his son to be a part of, so we tried to get him out. Tried to convince him to come with us, and Talon actually tries to leave this corrupted organization. Keyword tries though, as he sadly doesn't make it out alive. To which Tyrion, he comes out of exile and eventually makes his way to Light's Hope Chapel. Now the Lich King's betrayal, it would cost him dearly, as Darian he throws the corrupted Airring into Tyrion, which cleanses it, returns it to its original light state and forces Arthas to retreat. In front of the chapel, Tyrion declared that the Argent Dawn and the Order of the Silver Hands, they would come together as one, combine their forces in the Argent Crusade, bring Arthas down for what he has done to them. 
even the Death Knights, decided to join him on this crusade. An impossible mission that took them to Norfriends, but they completed it all the same. There must always be a Lich King though. So Tyrion places the helmet on Bol for Four Dragon, and then returns home to Hearth Glen. During Legion, the High Lord's life was ended by the demons, to which he passed on the Ashbringer, and Paladins of the World, they united in the Order Hall, right here within Light's Hope Chapel. The Death Knights also had the Order Hall, and they thought it would be really really cool to try and claim the body of Tyrion, make him a member of their Four Horsemen, but the Lights had something else to say. This chapel is protected by more than just sword and shield. To the east, we find another one of those sacred holy places. To the east lies Tyr's hand. In the past, there was actually quite a bit of speculation going on here on the naming of this place. Was there perhaps a connection to Keeper Tear? Was this the place where he had fallen? Was there a connection to the darkness beneath Tear's fall? The Chronicles has now cleared all of that up. Tear's heroic sacrifice, it made him a legend amongst the Vraiku and eventually the humans. That is the reason why they named these areas after Tear. This city also held its ground as the Scourge was over the land, allied to the Order of the Silver Hand until the faction started to splinter. They then decided to team up with the Scarlet Crusade. An organization infiltrated by Dreadlord is not the healthiest to find yourself in. The fate of the Scarlet Crusade is truly tragic, if somewhat ironic. At one point, they led the charge of humanity against the undead. Now they resemble those corpses that they once hunted. Together with the Brotherhood of the Light, another sub-faction that's art and crusaders at the core, except with less morals, guilt, and other useless human emotions to keep them in check. Together, we clean out Tyr's hands of the now undead Scarlet Crusade, and we claim it for the Light once more. In many ways, the Scarlet Crusaders, they were well-intentioned, but their zeal, it grew too strong, and their hate blinded them to reason. We can only hope that the same doesn't happen to the Brotherhood of Light. I offer service with a smile. The last thing to talk about for the Eastern Plague Lands, that is of course Fiona's caravan. Added with the Cataclysm, this caravan, it guides adventurers through the Eastern Plague Lands, going through the stories that we talked about, getting more passengers as we go. The more passengers that we have, the more people that we help out, the more zone buffs we gain access to. For example, there's Fiona's Lucky Charm, that will give you a chance to loot extra golden items from creatures. Argus's Journal, which gives you a 2% experience bonus, but anyone with a heart, you will of course pick Pamela's Doll. This will cause Pamela Redpaw to follow you in your adventure, and it doesn't really offer a buff, it's just fun company, but it does give you a chance to show the spirits more of the land. This caravan is traveling here because Gitwin Goldbraids and Terranar Sunstrike, they both want to join the Argent Crusade. Where's the Blood Elf? He has a more natural affinity to the lights. His dwarf buddy, he always spends his time studying, keeping up and pushing him every step of the way. Despite some protest, their journey to Light's Hope is interrupted a couple of times. Breaks at Crown Guard Tower and Light Shield Tower. Primor can be found in the zone, namely Eastwall, North Pass and Plaguewood. Now back in Classic, Blizzard tried to promote a little bit of world PvP with an event called a Game of Towers. Horde vs Alliance, fighting over control. For each tower that your faction was holding, all members of your faction within the Eastern Plague Lands, they deal 1% extra damage against undead enemies. If your faction then controls all four towers, this buff is increased to 5% in total. Each of the towers, it also offered special bonuses. Like for example, there was a ghostly flying mount to fly to the other towers. You could get an extra graveyard, NPCs to help you fight another tower, and a 5% hit buff. Truly epic rewards to go for, and from what I remember, people didn't really care. They didn't really care a whole lot about this event, which might explain why it was removed with the Cataclysm. So our buddies from the caravan, they eventually do make it to Light's Hope Chapel. They go through the trial and they become official members of the Argent Crusade. Gidwin, the one who already wasn't too happy about all these breaks that we took, he quickly became restless and goes out to fight the undead, when then he's captured by the enemy. A powerful paladin like himself would make for an incredibly strong death knight. So chances are that they haven't immediately killed him. Together we do everything that it takes to track him down. And together we confront Baroness Anastery and save Gitwin's life. <laughs> Fantastic! And there ends our adventures in the Plague Lands. Both Fiona and Akrudo, they would go on with adventuring together. You might even remember seeing them on alternate Draenor. And the name Anastery. It might sound familiar to those of you that have stepped into Strathon before. She's one of the bosses that you need to kill in order to make your way through the eternally burning city. 
However, I want to save the story of Strefholm for next week to give it a proper time that it deserves. So for now, thank you very much for watching everyone. By all means, let me know in the comments down below which zone you'd like me to cover next. It can be anything on Azeroth, even Outland or beyond. Truly your call. As always, subscribe if you like my videos, leave a like if you enjoyed this one, and until next time, see ya!